So, yeah, we finished up Galatians chapter five last week and just to put it all into, into context, anybody that wasn't here for the last five chapters, the, 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 the basic theme, oh, there you are, mom. The basic yeah. theme of Galatians, it's it's all about uh, continuing our this walk of faith with with the Lord, trusting Jesus the whole way through, not going back to the works of the law, the works of the flesh, not not going back to our self effort, but trusting that Jesus is sufficient, that we're justified, made righteous once and for all by the by the offering of the body of Christ. And that we we don't add anything to what he did. That we are fully justified. God is pleased with us, and we're righteous in His sight. And and so then, chapter five said that it was for freedom that that Christ has set us free. Don't be yoke. Don't be how do you put that? Stand firm and don't be subject again to a, a yoke of slavery. And that yoke of slavery, as he talked about in chapter four, was the slavery that that the false teachers the the Judaizers, the legalists, the, the religious leaders that were trying to put people back under the, the law, under this yoke of slavery that, that, that no one was ever able to live under in the first place. No one was able to perfectly keep the, the commandments, the law of Moses. And he said, don't, don't be subject to that, that yoke of slavery again. And, and he said, so don't go back under the, the works of the flesh, trying to make yourself more acceptable. Just trust that Jesus did it all. And he said that, that Christ set us free so that we could serve one another in love. That's the purpose of the freedom, not to, not to indulge the, the, the lust of the flesh, but to serve one another in love. And he said, if, he said, don't try to, if you're trying to be justified by the law, he said, you're obligated to keep every, every single commandment. So don't try to trust in one little bit of your flesh trust that Jesus did it all. And so he, he then he, he contrasted the difference between the spirit and the flesh. And we saw in, in chapter three, what, what it essentially means to live under the flesh is that we're living under the law, living by self-effort. And then in living by the spirit is living by faith in Christ, trusting that Jesus, that his sacrifice was sufficient. And so the the result, the works of the flesh, if we are living under the flesh, trusting in ourselves, the works are going to be evident. It's going to be anger, jealousy, division, disagreements, and so forth. And that's, and that's very common today, isn't it? Anybody who's living in the flesh, trusting in their own, their own uh, goodness, their own self-righteousness, you're going to have a lot of arguments. You're going to have a lot of divisions because it it's all comes down to our pride. We think that we deserve something and we deserve to be treated well. And when we aren't treated the way we think we're, we should be treated, we're going to be angry. We're going to be jealous and we're going to argue. So the, the contrast to that is to walk by the spirit, which is trusting in Jesus completely that, that, that his grace is sufficient, that, that God loves us no matter how imperfect we are. And the result of that is going to be the fruit of the spirit. It's going to be love, joy, and peace, et cetera. We're going to have love for others the way God has love for us. We're going to have joy in spite of our circumstances because we know we have an eternal home reserved for us in heaven, kept by the power of God. No matter what we go through in this life, we know we're secure in his hands. We're going to have peace because Jesus is our peace. We have peace with God because of the sacrifice of Jesus. And then we have peace with one another, those that have, have trusted in him as well. So, and it's important to keep in mind that, you know, we don't, we can't produce these, this fruit. It's a byproduct, isn't it? That's why it's called fruit. The, the works of the flesh are called works because that's what we produce when we're through our own efforts. So it, yeah, the irony is if we're, if we're trying to produce the fruit, that's, that's really a work of the flesh. So that the, the fruit of the spirit is just a byproduct. It's the, the result of resting in Christ, trusting in him, and he produces that fruit. It's, it's a natural outflowing of the, of the character of Christ through us. So he says that those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh along with its passions and desires. So we've, we've died to, to the flesh. We've, 
died to our own self efforts, trying to make ourselves righteous. We've trusted yeah. it all. And so as a result of that, as we walk in the spirit, we don't carry out the, the desires of the flesh. So we're in the spirit. Now we, that we need to walk in the spirit, continue to, to, to live out that life, trusting in Christ. So anyway, that's, that's the summary of chapter five and really the summary of, of all of Galatians up to this point. So anybody have anything to add to that? Anything that, you can clarify that I didn't make clear. That did that makes sense to you, Jess, since you didn't you weren't here for the five chapters. That that makes sense, or is anything me cleared up? You're good with that? Okay. All right. Roger, you have anything to add? Anything I left out or should have no. said? Good summary. Okay. All right. Thank you. So now that brings us up to chapter six, and which really, um, you know, again, there's, there's we're no original chapter division, so it's really just a continuation from chapter five, because the end of chapter five, it says, don't become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another, and then that leads right into chapter six. It says, brothers, brothers and sisters, if a man or woman is is trapped, is caught in a trespass or trapped in a trespass. You who are spiritual, restore them in a spirit of gentleness, looking out to yourself, lest you also be tempted. So, so what do you think that's all about? What, what should we do now in light of everything we've studied? What should we do when we see a, a brother, brother or sister in Christ that, that's trapped in a sin, caught in a sin? And well, I think it's, it's important to point out here when first time I read this after becoming a Christian I thought it meant you know if anyone's caught in a, in a sin or trespass it's like you're you're hiding behind a tree just waiting you know aha I caught you in a sin but that's not what this is saying at all it's it's someone who's caught in a sin it's like they're they're trapped it's it's like you know like an animal that's caught in a trap it's it's not that we're, yeah, you know, that we're looking around waiting to catch someone in a sin. It's, it's that they, that sin has caught them. They've been, they've been trapped in a sin, and they don't, they don't want to be in that sin, but they don't know how to get out of it. That's, that's the context of this. Like an animal caught, caught in a cage or caught in a trap. They, they don't want to be in there, but they don't know how to get out. So, so what should we do then when we see a brother or sister that's, that's caught in a sin or trapped in a sin? Should we should we condemn well, them and chastise them, or how should we respond? We should try to deal with them in gentleness and restore them back to a proper really relationship. Uh, but we have to be careful along the way that we aren't sin ourselves. Yeah, I think I think that's key, isn't it? We need we need to do it humbly, don't we? Knowing that that we could just as easily, if it wasn't for the grace of God, we could just as easily be caught in the trap just like anybody else and all of us probably were at one time or maybe maybe there's you know maybe we're trapped in sins that we don't even are even aware of so we you know we need to always be humble and gentle don't we knowing that just like uh first corinthians 10 13 says there's no temptation that's overtaking you except what is common to man so it's you know we're all subject to temptation we're all subject to sin we're all subject to being being trapped so we need to be very humble and gentle when we see a brother or sister that's trapped. And remember that, you know, they probably don't want to be in that situation. They just don't know how to get out of it. I think that's, I think that's important too. You know, it, I think a lot of times, you know, we look at someone and say, oh, you know, why, how can they do that? Why are they, why are they keep doing that? Thinking that, you know, they want to do that. But if they're, if they're in Christ, we know, we saw from last week, Romans 7, that, you know, if you're a believer in Christ, if you've got the Holy Spirit living in you, you don't want to be in sin. It's, but yet we can be trapped in it. Paul said, you know, sometimes I do the things I don't want to do and don't do the things I want to do. So I think that's important to remember, too, that, you know, just, you know, berating them and condemning them is not the, is not a good way to handle it. So any other thoughts on that? Okay. Um, the, the, 
the word, he says there another word that I want to point out when he says, it says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. The word there for restore, restoring them, that's the same word that's used for, can be used back then. It was used for uh, like setting a broken bone or mending the nets. Like remember when the disciples they mended their fishing nets their their nets got torn and they spent time mending their nets that's the same word that's used for that so it, it means that you know we're restoring it making it useful again you know when the nets were torn or the bone was broken you know it, it wasn't uh, as useful as it was before so we want to restore them so that they're they're useful again and like just like setting a bone you know, it can be painful at times, can it? If anybody's ever broken a bone, when you set that bone, it, it, it hurts. And uh, so, you know, restoring the person, it, it could be a little painful at times to, and I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I don't do well when I have to try to point out someone's, you know, you know, when someone's trapped in sin, I don't do well to point that out because I know that I've got my own flaws. So I don't like to, you know, go pointing my finger at someone else and say, hey, you know, you need to, you know, you know, you're trapped here in this sin. That's not right. I don't, so it's, it's a kind of a touchy situation, isn't it? And, and uh, well, I've, without going into any details, I've been given the opportunity to help someone recently that's in that situation. So it's, I'm getting an opportunity to put this into practice. So it's, you know, it's one thing to read it and know how to do it, but putting it into practice is, a, is another matter. So. Again, we need to do it humbly and gently. And I think part of it is to help them to, if, especially you know, if they are a believer, help them to, to walk by the spirit rather than by the flesh, and meaning help them to, to walk by faith, knowing that they are uh, secure in Christ, that he has made them righteous in spite of, in spite of the sins they're trapped in. Um, yeah, because... You know, we saw back in chapter five, the works of the flesh are some of these, you know, could, well, what were some of the works of the flesh? Some of the works of the flesh were, uh, let's see, idolatry, immorality, drunkenness. So, if, you know, if they're trapped in that, it could be because they're living in the flesh. They're not, they're not resting in what, what Christ has done for them. They might still be struggling and striving living living under the law trying to make themselves more righteous so i think that's part of the restoration process is to reinforce to them that you know jesus has made you righteous so rest in that stop striving and allow uh, allow christ's spirit allow the holy spirit to manifest his fruit through you rather than trying to make yourself more righteous does that make sense Okay. Now, the second question, I don't know if you've, re if you've ever read 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It sounds like Paul was being pretty harsh with someone that's, that's in sin. Why, is this a contradiction? Why? How does this situation in Galatians chapter 6 differ th from the situation in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? I'll give you a little background on 1 Corinthians chapter 5 if you haven't read it recently. That was a case where a so-called brother was was living in gross sexual immorality, and it was something that he said not even the pagans, not even the unbelievers do. And he said that he said you're boasting about it. And Paul had some pretty harsh words for him. Let's see. Let me, let me see what he said there. It's First Corinthians chapter five. Chapter five. Uh, it says there is, there's immorality among you that doesn't even exist among the Gentiles, among the heathens. And he says, you've become arrogant. You have not mourned instead. See, uh, that the one that has done this should be removed from your midst. He says, I, I've decided to deliver this one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? He says that he, he should be cast out. 
He says that, let's see. So I, I wrote to you that not, you're not to associate with any so-called brother. If he's an immoral person, if he's covetous, a reviler, a drunkard, etc. Don't even eat with them. So what, why, what's the difference here? Why is Paul being so harsh? It sounds like he's being harsh with this one in Galatians or in uh, first Corinthians chapter five, rather than being gentle with the person in Galatians chapter six. So what's, what's the difference? Do you see anything different between these two situations and why Paul would treat them differently? I think the difference is the attitude towards sin. Mm -hmm. In the first case, we were talking about somebody who was trapped in sin, mm -hmm. probably didn't want to be in that situation, and didn't know how to get out of it. In this scenario, the person bragging about the sin they're involved in and how uh, they're defying, basically defying God and doing what they shouldn't shouldn't do. Yeah, yeah good point. And, and Paul's concerned about that sin spreading maybe in the church to uh, infect the whole church. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's almost like the opposite scenario of Galatians. Remember Paul talked about the, the leaven in Galatians, the leaven of legalism spreading throughout the church. Now he's talking about the leaven of uh, licentiousness or uh, spreading throughout the church. So yeah, it was completely different scenario here in, in Galatians 6 as, as Roger said the person didn't he was trapped he didn't want to be in that sin in Galatians 5 the person's bragging about it they're boasting about it. they they don't see anything wrong with it and I think the, the key here it sounds like that it's someone who's calling himself a brother in Christ but really isn't because in verse 11 he says it's a so-called brother and in verse 5 he says we, he should be delivered over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. So it's someone that uh, is calling himself a brother and probably is not, has not even been saved. So Paul, Paul says there's, you know, drastic measures need to be taken. He's, he's, he's concerned, first of all, for this person's eternal salvation, the condition of his, of his, uh, his spirit and his soul. And also he's concerned about the condition of the church that that, doesn't spread to the whole church so so yeah that's the that's the reason for the difference as roger said it's the difference in the attitude of the person towards the sin whether they're uh trapped in it and don't want to be in it or whether they are bragging about it and thinking it's okay so well clear on that yes all right so next question question three revert refers to question six verses two and three how do we fulfill the law of Christ? Bear one another's burdens. Yeah. Yeah, bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. So, and it was just talking about the burden, one of the burdens there in verse one, wasn't he? One of the burdens is that we've, we've all got a burden of sin that we're dealing with, we've got a burden of temptation. Uh, I don't know. What are some burdens? We have um we've all got some burdens don't we things we're dealing with uh persecution maybe i don't know some someone that's mistreating us it's so we, we're to bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of christ remember back in chapter five he said that the law is is fulfilled in one word to love your neighbor as yourself so the two, I think, go hand in hand, don't they? If we're loving, if we're loving our neighbor as ourselves, we're we're also going to be bearing their burdens, aren't we? We're going to help help them to deal with the, the temptations, help them to deal if they're trapped in sin and not walking by faith, help them to deal with the the troubles of life. Uh, whether it could be a financial burden, could be a, an emotional burden, could be a physical burden. I don't know. I, I guess no, any number of things could fall under that. Anybody have any other thoughts on to add? All right. And again, doing doing it humbly and gently, right? Knowing that, and I think, well, I think, uh, well, the next couple of verses, I think are, is going to reveal that, you know, knowing that, that we've all got our own burdens. Verse 
verse five says, each one shall bear his own load. I think that plays into that as well, knowing that we've all got, got burdens to deal with. So we help one another deal with their burdens and admit that we've got our own as well. Let's see. Encourage one another, encourage one another to live, live by faith, live by the spirit, walking by faith in Christ, allowing him to carry us. I think that's going to be a big part of bearing one of those burdens is to remind people to cast all your cares on, on the Lord because he cares for us. Don't try to carry your burdens yourself. Trust in his grace. Share our own burdens as well. Let them know that we're that we're just as flawed and imperfect and don't have it all together. All right. So fulfill the law of Christ. Be humble and gentle. Be forgiving as well. Reconciling, restoring, not being judgmental or condemning. All right. So question number four. This is going to be related to really probably verses three through five. What does it mean to test our own work? He's saying there to examine your own work, then you'll have something to boast about and not regard another. What do you think that's about? I was kind of struggling with that for a while, but something I think maybe the Lord revealed to me this week, but I'll let see if anybody else has anything to share first. I put be humble, think of others, don't be selfish, don't try to make a good impression on others. And I guess I got that from Philippians. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's all all good stuff. Yeah. You know. And no one is perfect. Yeah, other than Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else have anything to add to that? I think we need to be objective when we look at, you know, how we're handling our responsibilities before God and um, not be measuring uh, by comparison to others, but using God's uh, measurement, <laughs> you know, how he would view how we are walking with him. Yeah. Yeah, don't compare yourself with one another. You know, I, I might think I'm pretty good if I look at someone down the road. If I pick the you know the worst person down the road, I might think I'm pretty good. But uh, when I look compare myself with Jesus, compare myself with, with God's perfect standard, I my my opinion's gonna change a little, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um and Matthew 7 came to mind as well. When he's, remember when Jesus says, you know, why do you notice the speck in your brother's eye and you don't even notice the log in your own eye? I, I think that's important too. It's, it's easy for us to, to find the, you know, the relatively minor imperfections in others, isn't it? And, and yet we might have a big flaw of our own and we, we can't even see it. So I think that's important too. You know, we want to be going around. I mean, we want to help our brothers and sisters when they are trapped in sin, but we don't want to be nitpicking and, and pointing out every flaw when we've got plenty of our own. So verse, verse 12 came to, came to mind as well. When, oh, wait, is it verse 12? Uh, no, that wasn't it. Uh, verse 14. We'll jump down to verse 14 real quick where Paul says, May it never be that I should boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So back to verse four, examine your own work, then you'll have something to boast about. Well, if, if we examine, like you said, Roger, if we examine our own work in, in light of God's perfect standard, I don't think we're going to boast about anything other than the cross of Christ, are we? I'm, I'm certainly not... I'm not going to have anything to boast about other than Jesus. I, I wasn't able to perfectly keep God's standard. So if I'm going to boast in anything, I'm going to boast in the cross. Uh, does that, that make any sense? All right. 
Um, and, and then how about verse, let's see what verse is it? How about verse five then? What does it mean that we have to each bear our own, our own load in, in light of what we just covered there in the first four verses? Is that it? Well, God, God gave us choices. I mean, he gave us choices that we make. So we're responsible for our own decisions and our conduct. Okay. But we can also at the same time, is this a contradiction of verse two? But we can help others with their burdens. Yeah. Too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. I don't. I don't think that's a contradiction. Obviously, it's not. We know there's no contradictions in the Bible. But uh, but yeah, I think it's just you know reinforcing that we've all got our own issues to deal with, right? We've all got our own uh, decisions to make. We've got loads to bear. And we, you know, we should we should help one another, and, and and don't be afraid to admit that you know I've got loads, I've got burdens I'm dealing with, and you know I you know, I could use some help with them because uh, we're we're members of one another, right? We're members of the body of Christ, members of one another, so we should be have concern for one another, and not be afraid to, to share our our troubles with one another, our burdens. All right, we all have our own shortcomings as well. So don't be hard on others and don't be so hard on yourself either, right? I think if you're anything like me, I tend to be hard on myself at times. So we don't want to go that direction either. All right. And then Verse six seems like that's kind of comes out of nowhere. What's that doing in there? I'm not even sure what, I don't even know if I have an answer of why that's in there. Anybody, <laughs> seems like out of, out of nowhere, he says, not let everyone who's taught the word share all good things with him who teaches. And I'm not sure what that has to do with, uh, anybody have any insight on that? Well, we need to pay them. <laughs> Pay the pastors, ones that are doing this full time, don't we? Mm -hmm. They're making a they're making a sacrifice. They could go out and probably get a job most anywhere and make more than what they'd make as a pastor. So yeah, we need to support our full time pastors, don't we? Full time pastors, full time teachers. So, so how do we reconcile that with Paul's words? couple of places where he didn't he said I didn't he didn't receive anything from others without paying for it what do you think the difference is there remember why Paul made those why he made those statements why he didn't he didn't collect any money for his teaching remember why well didn't he have a side job making tents he did he had a side job making tents, so he supported himself. He was a tent maker. Probably, I mean, that's a common Christianese term you hear, you know, tent maker, pastor that's a tent maker. That just means he has a side job. Yeah, he, 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 he was. He was a tent maker. He supported himself. Um, he also, he didn't want to be a burden. And he, I think the big reason was he said he wanted to cut the ground out from underneath the false teachers. Do you remember that? I, that was in, let's see, is that in, I think that was in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, maybe. Remember, Paul had a lot of uh, criticism from the, well, from the, the Judaizers, the legalists, the false teachers. Remember, just like in Galatians, Paul would come in, he'd establish a church, and then these false teachers would come back in and try to discredit Paul and Put people back under a burden, under the, the yoke of slavery. So Paul said he wanted to cut the ground out of them because he didn't want them. He didn't want anybody coming in and say, "Oh, Paul's just preaching for money." He, you know, just like. And unfortunately, we do see that sometimes on on TV. Some of these, some of the TV preachers, not all of them by any means, but you know that that's that was that's always a, a criticism uh, that that you know, all oh, you're just in it for the money. So Paul, didn't, Paul wanted to take that argument away from these false teachers that were coming in and trying to discredit his, his ministry. 
but but Paul wants to make it clear that yeah, there's nothing wrong with with supporting your full time pastors and teachers and ministers. And in fact, we should they 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 need to make a living as well. So Paul says his his payment was the satisfaction of sharing preaching the gospel without charge. He got satisfaction out of that, being able to do it without charge. He was able to support himself by making tents. He didn't want that payment to be an obstacle to the gospel. I think another way to support our teachers and pastors and so forth is just by supporting them with our, um, show our appreciation for them by verbally saying it. And also like, let's say, to the part of the ministry, use your gifts. Mm. You know, they need volunteers. They need so many people, whether it's cleaning bathrooms or singing on the choir or being an elder or a deacon, or I don't, there's just hundreds mm. of needs in an organization. And that that's supporting the pastor. And he's encouraged. I think when we as Christians are a part of it. Great point. And, you know, as you're saying that, that, that tends to, uh, Tie these verses together more now, doesn't it? As we sh we shall each bear his own load, so we're helping the the pastor to bear the load, the the, the work of the ministry, helping to encourage them. So, so thank you, Joyce. That just gave me some enlightenment on that. And and I, you know, working closely with with pastors, I know how that encourages them. Whenever you know, whenever there's volunteers, people come in and help, so that he doesn't feel like. He's you know got to carry the whole load himself. He's got to. Do so, so he's not a one man band. Yeah, and and any good pastor doesn't want to be a one man band. He he wants no. he knows he needs it, and they and you know, pastors. Well, ha having served on a couple elder boards, I know how discouraged pastors can get. So they they need all the encouragement they can get, whether it's you know verbal or uh, mm -hmm. helping volunteering and so forth. So. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Joyce. That really makes a lot of sense and ties this all together. All right. Now, this is, I think, going to be a tricky one here, or maybe not. Question number eight, and that's going to be verses seven, starting in verse seven. Talking about verse seven, he says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Wherever a man sows, that he will also reap. And I'm sure you've all heard that quote. It's, it's, this isn't the only place it's, it's in the Bible. It talks about sowing and reaping. And anybody who's ever done any farming or gardening, you know, you know whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. You know, if you sow corn, you're going to reap corn. If you sow weeds, you're going to reap weeds. So that's, it's a, I mean, it's a law law of nature and it's, you know, and it's a spiritual law as well. So it says you're going to reap whatever you sow. So then now we get into the, the nuts and bolts or get down into the weeds, no pun intended, but the, uh, it says about the one, one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corrupt corruption, but the one who sows to the spirit shall from the spirit reap eternal life. So what does that mean? I mean, if you, if you just read that one verse and hadn't studied the, the other five chapters of Galatians, it, it would that would be pretty con, pretty confusing maybe. But remember what in in light of you know the context and the theme of Galatians, what does it mean to to sow to the flesh? And I think one and versus what does it mean to sow to the spirit? I think one key there is sowing to the spirit results in eternal life. So. Let's start there. What, first of all, how do we receive eternal life? Through faith. By faith, right? Okay, so that's going to be one key, isn't it? Let's go to let's go to Galatians chapter three. I think Paul made it pretty clear in Galatians chapter three, verses verses two and three. Okay. Well, might as well start at verse one. Verse 1 through 3, okay? Galatians 3, verse 1, he says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you or who has uh, put a spell on you? Before your eyes, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified, okay? Now, verses 2 and 3, I think, is going to 
shed some light on what the difference between showing to the sowing to the flesh and sowing to the spirit. So this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Okay. And we know the answer to that, right? How did they receive the spirit? By, by hearing with faith, right? They received the spirit by faith. Okay. They didn't do it by the works of the law. So are you now so foolish? You began by the spirit and the spirit was received by faith, right? So you began by the spirit, which you, in other words, you began by faith. You received the spirit by faith. Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Okay. And remember, he said the difference between the spirit and you receive the spirit by the hearing with faith, not by the works of the law. So now they're trying to be perfected by the flesh. So what would the, the flesh be according to those two verses? It would be the works of the law, wouldn't it? They were going back to the works of the law, trying to be perfected by the flesh. So in other words, in the law, it, it could be, you know, we can make anything into a law. They, they were they were under the works of the law through trying to do circumcision, obeying the commandments, obeying the dietary laws. And we can make anything a law, and that's going to be a work of the flesh, isn't it? Whether it's we could make our uh, our daily quiet time could could end up being a work of the flesh. If if I think that I've got to spend you know X amount of time reading my Bible and praying in order to be right with God, that could be a work of the flesh. Now it could also be a, an act of faith if I'm doing it because just as an uh, because I'm in love with my savior, and I want to spend time with him. That, yeah, that would be, that's a wonderful reason to have your quiet time, your, your devotional, but I want to, you know, I want to be careful. I don't make that turn it into a, a work of the flesh thinking that I've got to do th these certain things in order to be right with God. So does that, does that make sense? Am I making that clear? So, okay. So sowing to the flesh, Remember in Galatians chapter four, Ishmael was the child born according to the flesh, wasn't he? That in Galatians chapter four it says Ishmael was born according to the flesh. Isaac was born according to the spirit. Remember Ishmael, Abraham and Sarah, they thought they were doing a good thing to produce Ishmael, didn't they? Because God made this promise that through your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And God made this promise when Abraham was, I believe, 75 years old. And here he is, what, I think it was 86 by that time. You know, number, what, 10, 15 years have gone by. God hasn't come through with this promise that so they thought, okay, here's, I'm going to have to help God out, right? And here's what we're going to do. And that's how Isaac, or that's how Ishmael was born. He was a work of the flesh. And God says, no, that's not the way it's going to happen. So it, that was, they thought that was a good thing. They thought they were helping God out. So we, we want to be careful. We don't do the same, fall into the same trap, thinking that you know, I'm helping God out by, uh, I don't know, keeping the commandments or whatever rituals I'm going through. You know, I'm not helping God out to fulfill his promises of, of uh, saving me, making me righteous. That Lathan, that Lathan. Um, so anyway. Hi, Grandma Benna. Hi. I have a brief intermission here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so something to the flesh then. Well, let me take you to one more passage that I think will reinforce it even more. Let's go to Philippians chapter three. Philippians chapter three, starting in verse, uh, let's go to verse two and three. Philippians chapter two, he says, beware of the dogs. That would be the Judaizers, the false teachers. Beware of the evil workers. Again, that's the, the false teachers. Beware of the false circumcision. Okay, that's, again, that's the Judaizers, these false teachers, these legalists. They, they were circumcised in the flesh. It says, beware of them. 
says, but we are the true circumcision. Okay? And here's what the true circumcision is. We worship in the spirit. Okay? We worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Okay. So here worshiping in the spirit means that we're glorying in Christ and we're putting no confidence in our flesh. Right. He says, even though he says, I myself, I might have confidence in the flesh. Anyone else can put confidence in their flesh. I have even more reason. And here's the reasons why he can put confidence in his flesh. Paul was circumcised on the eighth day. He came from the nation of Israel. He came from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, the law of Moses, he was a Pharisee. That's a high-ranking religious leader. As to zeal, he persecuted the church. He was doing, thought he was doing God's work by persecuting the church, thought he was doing a good thing. As to the righteousness was, which is in the law, he was found blameless. Okay, so these are all reasons to have confidence in the flesh. These are this is sowing to the flesh. If you're putting your trust, putting your confidence in your flesh, that all these rituals that he went through, his ability to keep the law and the sacraments and so forth, that would be sowing to the flesh, wouldn't it? On the con on, by contrast, sowing to the spirit would be glorying in Christ Jesus, putting all our confidence in Christ, in the cross, his sacrifice for our sins. Is that, is that clear? Yeah. Okay. So would we agree then, back to Galatians chapter 6, would we agree then that, that sowing to the flesh would be putting our confidence in ourself, our, it, it would be, it would be pride, it would be self-righteousness, it would be trusting in me, things I'm doing or not doing. And then sowing to the spirit would be putting my confidence in Christ, glorying in what Jesus did, putting my confidence in the cross, the sacrifice. Would that would that be fair to say? Or has somebody shown something anything different? Nope, that sounds good. Okay. So then what's, what's the result then of sowing to the flesh, putting our trust in ourself, putting my trust in myself and how good I am and, and how well I can keep all the rituals and commandments. What would be the, what's the result then? Of sowing to the flesh. Well, it leads to destruction and death. Now it might, it's fun for a season. You know, it might be great for a brief time, mm. but it ends up in, like I said, destruction and death and Amen. separation from God. Amen. That's, that's the ultimate result, isn't it? And yeah, and yeah, it could be, like you said, it could be pleasurable for a season. Isn't that what Hebrews, is it Hebrews 11? I think Moses said that sin is pleasurable for a season. But, but yeah, it might, it might make us feel good to put the, our confidence in our flesh, sowing to the flesh. But yeah, it's, it's not going to save us. It's going to lead to corruption. It's going to ultimately lead in and end up in eternal separation from God. And, and we saw back in, in chapter five of Galatians, <clears throat> what the works of the flesh are, some of the, some of the corruption and the destruction, it's, it's gonna be a, our characteristics are gonna be anger, strife, jealousy, immorality. That's gonna be the results of sow, sowing to the flesh, putting my confidence in myself, thinking that I'm more, you know, more righteous than, and uh, thinking that I have any righteousness on my own. So it's, yeah, it's nothing but corruption and destruction. So, so what's the, what are we going to reap if we sow to the spirit then? If we put our confidence in Christ, trusting that he did it all for us, resting in what he's done for us, what's, what are we going to reap when we sow to the spirit? Eternal life with him. Ultimately, it's going to be eternal life, isn't it? We're also going to, in, in this life, we're going to experience the, the fruit of that spirit as well, aren't we? We're going to experience the love, joy, and peace, et cetera, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And ultimately, it's going to be eternal life, being united with, with God's spirit. We're going to be joined with Jesus forever, joint heirs, eternal inheritance we obtain our inheritance and we uh, escape judgment and death amen amen escape judgment and death especially the second death the lake of fire 
Yeah. Yeah. What did Jesus say? It was it John eleven. Jesus said, "I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will how how do you put that? Whoever lives and believes in me will never die, will never experience the, the second death. He'll live even though he dies physically." Where am I now? Okay. Okay. Sign to the flesh also makes us a, a slave to sin. Saw that in, in Romans 7. We say to the flesh, living under the law, makes us a slave to sin, and corruption, bondage. And what Joyce said will have a harvest of spiritual decay and death. Hmm. Spiritual decay and death. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Let's see if I have any other notes that need to be shared. Let's see. Isaac was born according to spirit, trusting in the promise. And Abraham and Isaac finally gave up on their own efforts. Said, okay, Lord, it's all up to you. We can't do this. Isaac was born. So, trust that Jesus paid it all. He made us perfect by his once and for all sacrifice. Let's see. Second Corinthians 3.17. The Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So we have freedom, freedom to serve one another in love. We worship in the spirit, glory in Christ but no confidence in the flesh. All right. Also, we bear fruit to God, don't we? When we sow to the spirit, bear good fruit that it's God can use for his, his glory, his purposes. Romans 8 and 9, the life, the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. All right, now back to Galatians 6, verse 9, verse 9 and 10. After he talks about sowing to the Spirit, he says, don't, don't lose heart, don't be, don't lose heart in doing good, don't get weary. Why should we not be weary in doing good? Well, it brings blessing both to us as we keep on keeping on, and it benefits those who are receiving these mm. doing good, what we do for others. Um, they receive benefits as well and get blessed by it. Amen. And it brings glory to God. That's what we're supposed to do. Amen. So he's glorified too. Triple win. win. Yep. It's a blessing for us, a blessing for others, and it's a blessing for God. Brings him glory. Amen. Thank you, Joyce. Sounds like a pretty good reason. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna reap a harvest. Ultimately, the harvest is gonna be eternal life, but yeah, it's gonna be a harvest of blessings for others and, and a harvest of glory for God. Thank you, Joyce. Well said. All right. So why might we grow weary in doing good? Did you ever get, get weary doing good? We get discouraged. We get tired, physically tired. Mm -hmm. And we get distracted by the world too often. The, the things around us. And sometimes we get criticized and sometimes it's hard to handle it. Mm -hmm. and so. yeah. yeah. A lot of reasons to get weary, isn't it? Aren't there? I, I Paul think. talks about persecution. Yeah, that's a that's a very real reason to get weary. He, he experienced it pretty much, didn't he? Beaten, and most of us probably don't go through some persecution that Paul went through, but but still, yeah, you can get it can be discouraging. Deb probably gets tired of hearing me complain sometimes about our auto repair ministry because I 
sometimes that gets discouraging because, uh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't want to complain to you guys too. <laughs> There's lots of reasons to be discouraged, but but yet then every once in a while, you know, there's moments that really, you know, the Lord knows when you're discouraged and he'll bring someone across your path that really, really makes your day and, and you say, okay, you know, it is worth it after all. And you know, when you see one person that's really blessed by the ministry, you think, okay, I, I shouldn't be complaining. So, yeah. So, yeah, there's a, there's a harvest and yeah, the, the fields are right are white for harvest, aren't they? So, you know, even if even if uh, ninety percent of the time we don't see the results, it's it's a, it's worthwhile just for that. Every once in a while, when we see someone that you know comes to the Lord or someone that's really appreciates the ministry, so don't get discouraged and lose heart. In due time, we'll reap a harvest. You know that our labor is never in vain with the Lord. All right. Um, uh, a couple of those passages, a couple of notes I made on some of those, like the persistent widow, for instance, you know, sometimes we might wonder, you know, how long are we going to have to go through you know, this, this persecution or the difficult times that, you know, the, diff, the neighbor that's difficult to love, how, how long am I going to go, have to go through this? I can be, I can be discouraged and we have to, you know, trust that, you know, in the Lord's time, you know, he is going to return someday and he's going to set everything right. And someday we will, we will see him face to face in a world that's free from the corruption of sin and so forth. So, you know, the Lord is faithful and he is, Going back soon someday. All right. So, all right. So, we're not supposed to lose heart in doing good. So, who should we do good to? We pick and choose. It, it's easy to do good to people that are lovable, isn't it? Who should... <laughs> <laughs> we should especially do good to those of the household of faith. Yeah. What we're in the scripture there especially the household of faith he says do good to everyone especially the household of faith and sometimes that's not even easy even you know, you'd think that those from the they're in the household of faith you think it'd be you know easy to do good to them because they're always going to be lovable right or shouldn't yeah. <laughs> maybe yeah we aren't so lovable a lot of times <laughs> Uh, I, I just have to look in the mirror and I to yeah. True. yeah but it is true that some people are far more lovable than others yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah like yeah. Raj is very lovable <laughs> <laughs> oh my yeah I think sometimes it's I think it's even harder to be at times to be uh, to want to do good to the household of faith because we I don't know. Maybe we tend to put them, to set them, hold them to a higher standard. You know, we expect those in the household of faith to be lovable all the time, and you know, it, it just isn't doesn't happen. Yeah. So, I mean, the the world, the lost world. I, you know, I don't have high expectations. I expect them to, you know, to be unlovable. But you know, sometimes I expect the those of the household of faith to always be lovable, and that's. That's not realistic either. So anyway, um, again, I just had to look in the mirror and be reminded that we're not always lovable. So do good to, to all, especially those of the health, soul of faith, even, even when they're not lovable. Let's see. Is that a good place to stop or should we keep going? Let's see. Do we want to finish this in two weeks or three? 14, that's about halfway through. I think he's half done. Yeah, that's about, you want to stop there? That's good. That's probably a good place to stop. Sure. Be reminded to, to do good. Oh. All right. Anybody have any additional insights you want to share? Anybody want to? 
close in prayer or close in song or? I'll pray. Thank you, Roger. Father, we're so grateful for our time together in your word, for the fruit that it will bear in our lives if we but believe and receive it and allow it to uh, be sown into our hearts uh, that we might show forth the works of righteousness and do what is good in your sight. Lord, uh, help us where we fall short. Forgive us and help us, Lord, to um, yield to the spirit and walk with you. Thank you for our fellowship together, one another in Christ and, uh, and for the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. I pray that you'll continue to produce that kind of fruit in us. And thank you for tonight in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate all the, the good insights. Thank yeah. you. All right. We'll see. We'll see you in 2023. All right. Well, we, we can see you next week on Zoom. Yeah, well, well, that's what I meant. All right. All right. We'll see you next week, Lord willing. And okay. do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. Okay. Have a safe trip. Yeah, safe Thank travels you. tomorrow. Thank you. All right. See you, Jess. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. See ya. Yeah. Can you want to say bye? Come here. Hold on, Graham. Sit. Okay. Jude wants to say hi. Okay. Come here. Come say hi. Grandma and good uncle. Hi, <laughs> Jude. See you next week. Okay. Yeah, see you next week, Jude.